book of Exodus chapter 12 Exodus 12 and verse 12 for our message from the Word of God this morning as we mentioned in our scripture reading this morning Exodus 12 is on page 84 if you're using the Pew Bible but also, as we mentioned in Sunday school, um, Sunday school, in our scripture reading this morning, Exodus 12 is not very hard to find in anyone's Bible because it's the second book of the Bible. Exodus 12 and verse 12. Today's date is November 4th, 2018. Today's text will be found in Exodus 12:12 12, 12 and verse 13 as well. And the title of this morning's message is Did Christ die for all men? Did the Lord Jesus Christ die for all men? And we begin with the story of a mother who asked her son what he learned in Sunday school that morning. And he said, Our teacher taught us about how Moses was leading the people of Israel out of Egypt. And when he got to the Red Sea, he had his engineers build a pontoon bridge. And after all of the Jews walked across to safety, Moses called in an airstrike and some bombers blew up the bridge and drowned all the Egyptians. <laughs> and at this point, his mother asked, is that really what she said, son? And he said, No, but if I told you what she said, you'd never believe it. <laughs> well, as you may know, the night before the Red Sea crossing, God asked the Jews to sacrifice a lamb. A lamb called the Passover lamb. And then sprinkle that blood of that lamb on the doorposts of their homes. As we learned in our scripture reading in the first 11 verses of Exodus 12 this morning. And as we continue the story now here in Exodus 12, we learn why he told them to sprinkle that blood on the doorposts. I direct your attention at this time to Exodus 12 and verse 12 where we read these words. The reason you want to put that blood on your doorposts, God says is because I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. 
and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, as you can see, the reason God told the people of Israel to sacrifice a lamb and sprinkle the blood on the doorpost was to make sure that God didn't judge the people inside of those sprinkled doorposts. They were protected from God's judgment by the blood of that Passover lamb. And we know that this is a picture of what the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ does for you and I. We know that because of what the Apostle Paul says in your first cross-reference in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 where he says, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. When God saved the Jews from His judgment with the blood of the Passover lamb, that's obviously a picture of how He saves us from His judgment with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we read in your next reference in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. Ye were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. But the question that we want to address this morning is, did he die for all men? Now, if you're wondering, well, who would ever think that he didn't? Well, I myself used to think that he didn't. Back when I was a Calvinist who believed that God chooses or elects who will be saved, I used to argue that if Christ died to pay for the sins of non-elect people, people who eventually end up in hell, that would mean the blood of Christ failed to do its job. Sounds pretty convincing, doesn't it? I reason that if non-elect people have to go to hell to pay for their sins, then Christ must not have paid for them very well, right? So as a Calvinist, I believed that Christ only died for the elect, the ones He chose to be saved. Now, as you can see from that, Calvinists mean well. They're trying to keep the blood of Christ from looking like it didn't do a good job in paying for someone's sins. But as we've seen the past couple of Sundays, God does not choose or elect who will be saved. Men must choose to be saved by believing the gospel. And if they don't believe the gospel, the real reason they have to go to hell is found in what you read in your next reference there in Hebrews 4 and verse 2. The writer of Hebrews says, Unto us, and he's talking about believers, Unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, talking about unbelievers. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. As you can see, folks, the real reason unsaved people have to go to hell 
It isn't because Jesus Christ didn't do a good job paying for their sins. The real reason is they refuse to believe the Gospel. And the Gospel today is Christ died for your sins. If you don't believe He paid for your sins, then you have to go to hell to pay for your sins for all eternity. In other words, it's not enough that Christ died. If you don't believe the Gospel, His death doesn't profit you. Just like it wasn't enough that the Passover lamb died. The lamb's death didn't profit them if they didn't believe the gospel that God told them. Don't forget, the word gospel just means what? Good news. Good news. And the good news that God told the Jews is that He would pass over them and not judge them if they applied the blood of the Passover lamb to their doorposts. If they didn't believe that, that gospel, that good news, they were judged. But in calling Christ our Passover, that's what Paul's trying to teach us. That God made the blood of Christ available to all, but it only saves, it only profits those that apply it by faith in His blood. Something Paul talks about in Romans 3.25, and I didn't include that verse, but I think you know that verse. Now, if you're thinking that Calvinism doesn't have any verses to support uh, the view that Christ didn't die for everybody, think again. Back when I was a Calvinist, I used to use the words the Lord spoke in your next reference in John 10. And we skipped around verses 11, 15, and 26. The Lord said, <clears throat> I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for everybody. Is that what here said? No. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And he went on to say, I, I lay down my life for the sheep. And then later he said to some unbelievers, Ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep. Well, uh-oh. The Lord said He gave His life for sheep. And then He told some unbelievers, they're not sheep. Well, that sure sounds like He's saying He didn't die for them, doesn't it? And as we begin to address this argument and these verses, we have to do so by asking, so who are the sheep? <laughs> Calvinism holds that the sheep in the Bible are the elect. The ones He chose to be saved. And the lost sheep you read about in the Bible, well, those are the elect that just haven't gotten saved yet. <laughs> they, they are elect sheep, but they're still lost elect sheep. But here's the thing. As a dispensationalist, you know who the sheep really are. Because you know what the Lord said to the twelve apostles in Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6. These twelve Jesus sent forth, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. <laughs> well... When the Lord said, don't go to the Gentiles, go rather to the sheep, that must mean that the sheep in the Bible are not Gentiles. Jews in the house of Israel. And the lost sheep are Jews who haven't gotten saved yet, right? So, when the Lord said that the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. 
he was actually saying he gives his life for the Jews. Now maybe you're thinking, oh wait a minute, does that mean he was saying that he didn't give his life for the Gentiles? And the answer is yes, that's exactly what he was saying. And listen, if the Bible ended on that page describing the Lord's ministry, you and I as Gentiles would be in big trouble. But you know the Bible doesn't end on that page describing the Lord's earthly ministry to Israel. You know that later on the Apostle Paul went on to say in 1 Timothy 2 verses 5 and 6 that Christ Jesus gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Before Paul came along, folks, nobody testified that the Lord would die for Gentiles. It's one of the reasons Paul was made an apostle, as he went on to say in your next verse, in 1 Timothy 2.7. After saying in 2, 5, and 6 that Christ gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, he says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. That's why I was made an apostle. To let it be known that he didn't just die for Jews, that he died for Gentiles as well. And then Paul adds, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. <laughs> Do you ever wonder why he had to say that? Well, it was because until he came along, nobody said that Christ would die for Gentiles. So he had to lift his hand and swear, I ain't lying about this. Before Paul, not even Christ himself said he would die for Gentiles. He said he would die for the sheep. The sheep of the Jews. And listen, if if you went around saying things that the Lord Je Jesus didn't say like the Apostle Paul did, well, you'd probably think you had to swear you weren't lying too. But now, this explains another verse that Calvinism uses to say that Christ didn't die for all men. It's in your next reference in Matthew 20 and verse 28. The Lord said the Son of Man came to give His life a ransom for many. Now when He said He gave His life a ransom for many, that word many is not all. That word many limits His atonement. And you know what the word atonement means. The work that Jesus Christ did on the cross atoned for your sins. But the Lord said He gave His life a ransom for many. And that's why Calvinism calls this doctrine limited atonement. But listen, the Lord wasn't limiting His atonement to the elect as opposed to the non-elect. He was limiting it to Jews as opposed to non-Jews, the Gentiles, as we've already seen. And all of that answers yet another verse that Calvinism uses to say Christ only died for the elect. I know you know these verses in Isaiah 53 because they describe the death of Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all for the transgression of my people was he stricken. One of my books on Calvinism says that that's God speaking, saying that the Lord was stricken for his people and that his people were the elect. But... That is not God talking about my people. <laughs> That's Isaiah talking about my people. And Isaiah's people were who? The people of Israel. And as far as Isaiah knew, that's who Christ would be stricken for. 
The due time had not yet come for Paul to reveal that he would be stricken for the Gentiles too. But listen, even if you make that God's people, God's people weren't some elect group that he's chosen to be saved. And you know that because of what you read in your next reference in 2 Samuel 3 and verse 18. The Lord has spoken, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save who? My people Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. God uses that phrase, that my people Israel phrase, dozens of times in the Bible. The people of Israel were God's people, not just some elect chosen group. Now, Calvinism also uses something else. The Lord said to teach that Christ died only for the elect. It's in your next reference in John 15, verses 13 and 14. Remember when the Lord said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Well, uh-oh. <laughs> it sounds like he's saying that he planned to lay down his life only for his friends who did what he commanded him. Com commanded them, I should say. But, what did Paul say about that in your next reference in Romans 5? In verses 6 and 10, Paul said, Christ died for his friends. Is that what yours said? No! For the ungodly! And then he went on in verse 10 to say, when we were enemies, not just friends, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Paul said that the Lord didn't just die for His friends who did what He commanded them to do. Paul said He died for His ungodly enemies. You know, the people who most likely wouldn't do what He commanded them to do. So, why did the Lord say that He'd lay down His life for His friends? Well, look what James says in your next reference in James 2.23. The Scripture saith, Abraham was called the friend of God. And when it says the Scriptures say that, James was quoting the next two references that you have there. Second Chronicles 20, verse 7. Talking about, Ab this is talking to God, Abraham, thy friend. And then God speaking in Isaiah 41, 8 says, Abraham, my friend. Folks, Abraham was the friend of God. And he was not the only friend God had in the Old Testament. All the Jews who descended from Abraham were considered his friends too. You say, how do you know that? Look at what it says about Christ in your next reference in Zechariah 13.6. Zechariah was a prophet, so he's talking about what will happen in the future. And speaking of Christ, he says, One shall say unto him, What are these wounds? in thine hands. And looking back now, we know, of course, it's talking about the wounds that were caused when they nailed His hands to the cross. And then He shall answer, These are uh, those with which I was wounded where? In the house of my friends. And whose house was the Lord wounded in? the house of Israel. So, when the Lord said He's going to lay down His life for His friends, 
he was saying he planned to lay it down for the Jews like we've been seeing. But Paul later revealed he also died for us Gentiles. You know, if you're getting the feeling that dispensationalism is the answer to Calvinism, you're getting the right feeling. Because it is. Now, while Paul was the first to say that Christ died for Gentiles, he wasn't the only one in the Bible to say it. Look at your next reference in 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. John says, Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. That's a big word that mostly just means satisfaction. You read Isaiah 53 and it says, God was fully satisfied with the payment that Christ made for our sins. And John says He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, most Christians think John was saying that the Lord wasn't just the propitiation for saved people. He was the propitiation for unsaved people too. And you could read it that way. But as dispensationalists, we know John was writing to the Jews. So what he was really saying is, the Lord wasn't just the propitiation for us Jews. He was the propitiation for Gentiles too. The reason he had to say that, of course, is because the Lord in His earthly ministry said that His propitiation was just limited to the Jews. But listen, either way you read it, whether you read it's not for our saved people's sins, but it's also for the sins of unsaved people, no matter how you read it, it still says that He's the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. Now you're probably wondering how I used to view that verse as a Calvinist and how Calvinism views that verse. Well, they hold that it means the world of the elect. The world of the chosen. And if you're thinking, mm, that's a bit of a stretch, uh, I have to share with you what Dave told me. I called him to help me remember some of the things that he and I used to teach as Calvinists. And uh, he told me that that explanation of the world being the world of elect, he, he said he thought that was a bit hinky. And uh, I had to look the word hinky up because I wasn't sure what hinky meant. <laughs> hinky means suspicious. And uh, I agree. I think the, the wish is father to the thought there. The only reason anyone would read that and say, well, he's talking about the world of the elect is because that's what they want it to say. Well... About the only other verses that Calvinism uses to support limited atonement are verses like what we read in Romans 4.24, your next reference there, where Paul says, Jesus was delivered for our offenses. Since Paul was writing to believers... It's argued that that word our means that the Lord was only delivered for the offenses of believers who were obviously elect because they believed. And the same argument is made for Romans 5.8. Christ died for us, for us believers. Galatians 1.3 and 4, Jesus gave himself for our sins. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us, us the elect, from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Ephesians 5.2, Christ hath loved us and hath given Himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. 
And it's only for us that that sacrifice was made. Us elect. Us believers. But listen. If I'm talking to you on the phone and I say to you, I give my life to prepare these messages for you, which I do, by the way, pretty much. It might not always show, but I always do. But if I say I give my life to prepare these messages for you, do you assume from that that I mean that I don't give my life to prepare these messages for the person sitting next to you? No. Do you assume that I don't mean I give my life to prepare these messages for the dear people watching the video and listening to our audio? No, of course not. That is not a legitimate conclusion. So when the Bible says things like 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, Jesus died for us, even though He's talking to believers there, that doesn't limit it to believers. When Titus 2.13 and 14 says Jesus gave Himself for us that He might redeem us. And when 1 John 3.16 says He laid down His life for us. It isn't saying the Lord died for us to the exclusion of other people. And all you have to do to prove that is look what Paul says in your next reference in Galatians 2 and verse 20. Paul said, The Son of God loved me and gave Himself for me. <laughs> well, how many of you think Paul was saying that he thought the Lord Jesus Christ only died for him personally? No! He wasn't saying he died for him to the exclusion of others. And all of those verses we just read aren't saying that he died for the elect to the exclusion of others either. Now in conclusion, maybe you're thinking, why should I care? Why should I care if Christ only died for the elect? Because I'm saved, so I must be elect. Well, the reason you should care about it is, how do you know you're elect? You say, well, because I believe the gospel. What gospel? The gospel of Christ died for us. Well, if He didn't die for all men, how do you know you're part of the us that He died for? That's why you should care. I know because over the years of answering emails at BBS, I've been asked many times by troubled souls, how do I know if I'm elect? How do I know if Jesus died for me? If the atonement is limited to some, how do you know you're part of the sum? That is why I am so very thankful so very glad that <clears throat> when I stood here 40 years ago, not behind this pulpit, we got a new one since then, <laughs> but when I stood here 40 years ago on this platform, got a new carpet too, <laughs> when I stood here 40 years ago as a guest speaker while Pastor Lee was away and I taught the doctrine of limited atonement, Thornton Harrison did not let me get away with it. After I got done, I asked Thornton to close in prayer. And he stood up and prayed and thanked God for sending His Son to die for all men. He wasn't about to let some punk teenager... <laughs> stand up in his church and impugn the integrity of God. Because, folks, that's what the doctrine of limited atonement does. If Christ didn't die for all men, then unbelievers can stand up on judgment day and say, it's not 
fair. I never had a chance. Christ didn't die for me, so I couldn't be saved. And they could charge God Almighty with unrighteousness for not providing salvation, a Savior, a Passover lamb for everybody. Thornton may not remember that. <laughs> He's shaking his head. No, he doesn't remember that. But I'll tell you this. I will never forget it. Because it's one of the many things that makes me proud to be the pastor of Faith Bible Church in Steger, Illinois. Because this church is still filled with people like that. And if you're not saved, I'm proud to be able to say what the Bible says in your last reference in Hebrews 2.9. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death on the cross that He by the grace of God should taste death for every man. If you'll believe that, dear unsaved friend, God will save you. If you don't believe that, then you're going to get more than a taste of death. The Bible describes the lake of fire as the second death. And it is eternal. You've heard of eternal life? It's eternal death. So I would encourage you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, we do pray for those who hold the doctrine of limited atonement. We know their heart's in the right place. We know they mean well. But we pray, Father, that uh, they might have this clear so that they too can share the gospel with others and say to people, Christ died for our sins. And then, Father, I pray that you'll help us to remember these words to share with them. We pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.